Hi there! In this video, we will be reviewing things not to do when building a computer. So a few years ago, TC, or Managing Editor, built a gaming desktop. But it's kind of out of date, and it's definitely not going to hold up for Battlefield 5. So let's build a new one. You can build a gaming desktop for around $1,000, but I want to go all out, so I spent around $2,000. PC like this is going to be able to play most games at ultra settings. You don't need to spend $2,000 to build a custom PC that'll play the latest titles on ultra settings. Many tech channels have shown that. So what do you need to build a desktop? Well, of course, first you need a table. Preferably not metal. If it's going to be metal, have an anti-static working surface layered on top of it, a thermal paste applicator, an Allen wrench, some tweezers to tie up the wires, a Swiss Army knife, which hopefully has a Phillips head screwdriver in it, and last but not least, an anti-static bracelet, which is to protect you and the parts. Those be zip ties, not tweezers, and you need a regular Phillips screwdriver. An anti-static wristband requires you to be grounded. Just having a band on your wrist adds no benefits, besides maybe a fashion statement. These are the parts you're going to need, but more importantly, before we get there, we need to understand what these parts are doing and how they interact with one another. To better understand the parts that make up a desktop, let's try to understand them individually. The processor is like the computer's brain, a base of calculations that control everything the computer does. The motherboard is like the foundation, serving as a main structure for all other parts to be added to. It also allows the other parts to communicate with one another, which also makes it kind of like a nervous system. Graphics cards are responsible for rendering and processing visuals into what you see on screen. Our PC's power supply is of course channeling electricity, in that it adjusts and provides the right amount of energy to keep it running. Last but not least, RAM, or random access memory, and your hard drive are good examples of short-term and long-term memory, respectively. If you want to better understand what kind of computer to build, then first figure out what you want to use it for. A gamer might care more about a graphics card than, say, a video editor who might want extra RAM to assist with editing large files. If you're building a budget build for video streaming, say, under $1,000, you want to focus on parts, like a Core i5 or Core i3 processor, that require less energy. They'll be less powerful, but then you'll be able to scale back the cost of several other parts. And if you need help choosing the right parts for your build, there are sites like PCPartPicker.com that help show presets for which parts fit together, which sort of part conflicts you might have, and where to find deals on new parts. We have a lot of boxes and a lot of PC parts, so it's best if you unbox them, isolate the parts that you really need, place items into the case, and make sure that they all fit, and then start working. And now we're really going to start building by adding the motherboard in. Some notes about installing motherboards, they're really delicate, you should be really careful with them. And screw in with confidence, but also don't screw in too hard, otherwise you could crack the board. I chose Asus's Z370 motherboard for two main reasons. One, it has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and also it has support for NVMe SSDs, meaning you can get really fast SSDs that are really easy to install. Pay close attention to the brace that goes at the back of the computer. This brace is actually called an IO shield. You always have to make sure that you really hammer it in because there's no screw. It really just has to go outside of the case and clasp onto the frame. And this is very important because otherwise you can't align the motherboard correctly with the holes. We're just going to start installing all eight screws. So next we're going to install the RAM on the motherboard. I chose Corsair's 16GB Vengeance LED RAM for two main reasons. One, it has LEDs and we do like lights in our gaming desktops. Secondly, uh, it's pretty fast RAM. It's 2,666 megahertz, I believe. So it's pretty fast and this motherboard supports that speed, which is most important. 2666 RAM is actually on the low end. You can get into the 4,000 megahertz. Anything around 3,200 megahertz will be good. Open the slots first and just aligning the stick with the middle of the strip, not with the end, and just lining that up with the logo. When installing RAM, you will want to check your motherboard manual to see what RAM slots are for what channel. Install RAM in the wrong slots can prevent your system from booting or you could get slower performance. So once you hear that solid clasp and you don't see the gold connectors on the side anymore, that's when you know the RAM is in. Step three, we're going to install the hard drive, or in this case, the NVMe SSD. I chose this format of solid state drive so that I could input it into the motherboard without having to worry about extra wires or putting it in a separate part of the case and just getting really messy. This is from Kingston, 
and it's 480 gigabytes, so it's not a lot, but you can always upgrade this and swap it out, and it's only held down by one screw and the latch, so it's really simple and really straightforward. When installing a M.2 drive, make sure the standoff is installed first. Speed for gaming is important when it comes to a hard drive. You want files to write quickly and you want games to load quickly, so that's why it's best if you use an SSD. Okay, so step four, we're going to install the graphics card. I chose PNY's GTX 1080, which is overclocked. And so it's a pretty easy installation. You're just gonna find the gold connectors and you're gonna line this bracket with the back end bracket of your PC case. Now, which lane you choose depends entirely on what other parts you're gonna put in the system. I'm just gonna pick the top one because the SSD is at the bottom and I don't wanna cover it. I just think it looks nice. Again, check your motherboard manual. Not all PCIe slots are the same. Just because it's a full length slot doesn't mean it'll run at 16x. There are only so many PCIe lanes to the CPU, so motherboard manufacturers will lower the speeds on other slots to 8x or even 4x. Click down. Take your remaining brackets and just put them in the spots that you haven't used. You don't have to screw these in, they get bolted down by the back end bracket and your GPU is installed. Power supply time. I chose Corsair's 850 watt power supply because I need enough headroom for ray tracing GPUs when they come out and I don't want to have to upgrade it again. So all you have to do is take the brick and make sure that you align it with these little insulating pads so that the power supply doesn't short circuit and come into contact with the rest of the system. So just take it in slide it in nice and easy until you have a snug fit and then shift it to the back and make sure it's right up against the frame. This case has vents on the back case panel, which is meant for the PSU. What he is doing is restricting airflow to his PSU. Now you just take the required screws and you tighten and screw in. So next step, we're going to install the CPU core. In this case, it's gonna go on the top end of the case and we're just gonna have the hose hang out for a little while until we install the processor, which is gonna come a little later. Always be sure to try to place it in the system first before you install it, because you can see it takes up a lot of space. But in this case, no pun intended, it fits in perfectly, and we're gonna start screwing it in. And so there's nothing special about this screwing in process. They're just really long screws because they go through the entire frame of the cooler. These long screws are meant to go through the pants. And they take forever. So next up, cables. Every power supply is gonna come with a big bag of Velcro cables. It's kind of daunting at first, so you always have to find the ones that are gonna fit. You usually get this big bag of cables when you have a modular PSU. In this case, you need to match those cables with the correct descriptions on the power supply. Next step is we're connecting the power supply to the motherboard with a 24 pin cable. We're just matching that cable from the motherboard, threading it through the back and attaching the 24 pin header to the power supply so that we can have one of the connections complete. The next few additions will be for the GPU, for any specific ports that the case has, for any lighting that the case has, the CPU cooler, the, anything else really. We're installing the CPU, the heart of the computer or the brain, depending on how you look at it. So to do this, we're just gonna remove the plastic covering that they put on the motherboard. We're just gonna take this little plastic part out. We'll just toss that out of here. You don't wanna throw away that plastic part. If you ever need to RMA your motherboard, most manufacturers require it. And now we have an exposed CPU holder, or rather slot, on the motherboard. When you install a CPU, you install it into a socket, not a slot or holder. And we're gonna use the CPU applicator. This is a special little part that not everyone may get, but this motherboard that we got from ASUS definitely does have. It's called a CPU installation tool. It makes it really useful if you want to install a Core i7 Hexacore CPU. Yeah, we've got one. Last I checked, getting a Hexacore i7 CPU is pretty easy to get your hands on these days. And it's an eighth generation chip and it's ready to go and it supports overclocking. So what having this little installer does for you is it's basically a brace that you can apply right to the CPU and light it up with the triangles that you'll see on the bottom left corners. And this will make it easier for us to apply it to the motherboard and then apply thermal paste and then apply a CPU cooler on top. And we're just gonna carefully lean it down into the system and make sure that everything lines up 
and we're gonna clasp down on it and we'll be good to go. So we're about to apply thermal paste to the CPU. Every CPU cooler actually comes with a bit of thermal paste already neatly applied in a circle around it, but it's usually not enough. It's good, essentially PC building practice to have a little bit extra and layer it on top of the CPU. Most CPU coolers will come with thermal paste if you are not looking into overclocking. What's already there will work just fine. If you ever need to apply thermal paste, all you need is a pea size amount. The final portion is to add the CPU cooler to the top end of the processor. So you're gonna see that there are four brackets, or rather like screws in here with brackets and holders right here. And they're going to keep the cooler raised off the processor, but it's also gonna be close enough to actually physically come in contact with it, like basically keep it cool. Take thumb screws like this and just screw them on. So now that our internals are done, we're gonna put all the panels back on, which is the top glass, side glass, front glass, and of course the back panel where all of this fun stuff is happening. Quick notes, the processor should be one of the first things you install. Try to build as much of your system outside of the case so you can verify everything works. You don't want to have everything installed in the case and a part not work. Check your motherboard manual to make sure everything is installed correctly. Don't rush anything, take your time. There's lots of tech tubers with review, installation, and how-to videos out there if you get stuck. Thanks for checking out our video. If you have any questions, leave a comment. Want to see more videos like this? Subscribe and click that bell.